And uh, thank you everyone who has joined us from different parts of the globe and the world. Uh, we have people from obviously Ireland and uh, we have some people from uh, Ramallah um, and uh, Jerusalem and Israel um, and also America and different parts of Europe. So you're all very welcome to Dublin. And uh, our webinar uh, this evening is Militarized Israel how living in a highly militarized state affects children and young people in Palestine and Israel. And we're looking at a non-violent approach to that problem. A special welcome to our panelists today. Um, that's Ayad Abu Atesh. He's the accountability manager for DC IP, Defense for Children International. Uh, Shahar Peretz, a young Israeli refuser from Kfar Yona. And uh, we, are wait we are waiting for Miko Pellet, uh, a writer, speaker, uh, a writer speaker, human rights activist. And uh, he's been delayed. He's, he's speaking from Washington, I think it is. The evening, the evening is hosted by COLOF, the Irish Association of Development Workers and Volunteers. And it's organized by the COLOF Justice for Palestine group, which is a member group within COLOF. My name is Dermot O'Brien, an, edu an educationalist, former deputy principal for curriculum innovation and global education in Ballyfermot College of Further Education. And I'll chair uh, this evening and also the facilitator for the event. The running order, just to give you an idea of what we're doing here, uh, I'll ask uh, Yulia uh, from Koloff to say a few words firstly. And then we'll invite the speakers each to speak for 10 minutes. Uh, after the speakers are finished, we'll have time for question and answer session and maybe some discussion. Uh, fo following that, uh, I'll go to uh, Robin O'Barn, who will say a few words about the Call of Justice for Palestine group. And we'll come back to the speakers to uh, give a final departure word. So that's really our program. We hope to wrap up by 8.20. And uh, I hope for the people in, uh, in Palestine and Israel, we don't keep you up too late because of the time difference. So um, I think I'll pass it straight over to Yulia uh, from Kolov. And uh, maybe you'd say a few words about Kolov for the people who are unaware of the organization. Thank you so much, Dermot, um, and welcome everyone and hello, um, everyone. Um, as Dermot said, my name is Julia Heimlinger. I'm COLOF's Volunteer Engagement Project Officer. So a warm welcome on behalf of COLOF. Uh, we are the Association of Returned uh, Volunteers and Development Workers. We support people in their, in their work uh, for social justice. So work with returned volunteers, partner organizations, um, and uh, grassroots activists, member groups. Uh, one of these groups is the Justice for Palestine group that are hosting this event tonight, um, which um, uh, looks like an excellent event already, uh, and so good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, if you want to find out more about COLOF, uh, maybe just check out our website, which is koloff.org. Uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's also um, just if you Google Koloff, it comes up for more talks on, on similar issues. Um, and the group Dermot will share that as well. So um, yeah, enjoy the event uh, and good seeing you all. And I'll hand back to Dermot. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Julia, for that. Um, I think we'll get straight into it. and. Uh, ask uh, Ayad um, to uh, speak for, for us, to us about uh, the problems of children. Ayad is, uh, works for Defence for Children International uh, since 2000. And uh, he's, uh, the DCIP is the organization, Defence for Children pa International Palestine. They investigate, document and expose human rights violations against children. Ayad has over 20 years experience in the field of education. Uh, children's rights and publications include No Way to Treat a Child, Palestinian Children in Military Detention System, 
Operation Protective Edge, a war waged against gassing and children, growing up between settlements and soldiers, and there's a lot more publications that DCIP uh, have put out. IAD is really very well placed to understand the effects of militarization on children and young people. So uh, I'll hand it over to you, IAD, uh, take it away, it's all yours. If you unmute yourself, I, uh, you're still muted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to brief you about the situation facing Palestinian children in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, as you said, I work for Defense Children International, which is a child rights organization affiliated to international movement. Uh, DCI uh, Palestine uh, work um, in order to document the Israeli violation as well as the Palestinian violation against Palestinian children's uh, rights, in addition to provide legal services for Palestinian children, mainly who are prosecuted in the Israeli military legal system. And uh, um, mainly we start as an organization to provide legal services for Palestinian children. And this was 30 years ago. And unfortunately, until this time, we are doing the same job. But uh, during the way we expanded our work in order, in addition to providing Palestinian children with uh, legal services um, before the Israeli military legal system, we are documenting the Israeli violation to Palestinian children's rights. And as a small organization, we do not have the capacity to document all the Israeli violations to Palestinian children's rights. Uh, so we concentrate on the right to life and the right to liberty. And uh, when speaking about the right to life, we document the child killing, injuries, uh, settler violence, and using Palestinian children as human shells. Uh, for example, since the start of the Second Intifada until now, we documented the killing of 2,200 Palestinian children. The majority of those children were from Gaza Strip, especially during the uh, Israeli invasion and military aggression against uh, Gaza Strip. For example, um, in the year or uh, uh, 2014, we documented the killing of uh, 500 50 Palestinian children uh, as a result of the Israeli aggression against Gaza Strip. Uh, last year, during uh, May, military assault against Gaza, we documented the killing of 60 Palestinian children, in addition to another 17 children in the West Bank. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, 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 the other thing, or the other right uh, violation that we are documenting it's the issue of ill treatment and uh, torturing Palestinian children who are arrested and persecuted by the Israeli military. Every year, Israel arrests around uh, 700 Palestinian children and persecute them in the Israeli military legal system that lacks the fair trial guarantees. Uh, so DCI, in addition to providing the legal services, we came to the conclusion that we can't um, uh, uh, get justice through the Israeli military legal system because the whole system is designed not in order to administer justice, but to suppress and control Palestinian people among them uh, children. So every child who is arrested and interrogated by the Israeli military exposed to different types of ill treatment and uh, torture. Every year uh, we collect like... Uh, 200 affidavits from Palestinian children where they inform us about their experiences within the Israeli military legal system and the types of ill treatment and torture that they exposed to. Uh, according to DCIB documentation, around uh, three-fourths of Palestinian children exposed to physical violence during their arrest, transfer, and interrogation. Uh, they exposed to different types of ill treatment like um, uh, handcuffing, blindfolded, uh, exposing to the elements, um, uh, position abuse. And um, during the last period, we 
uh, noticed that Palestinian children exposed more to psychological forms of uh, uh, ill-treatment and torture, like uh, threatening and in uh, inducement, and placing children in solitary confinement, uh, which is a, a, a cell that measures one by two without having any uh, uh, communication with uh, human beings, just the interrogator and the uh, prison uh, guide. And the main purpose of this uh, uh, practice or, and all the ill treatment and torture that Palestinian children are exposed to is to extract confession from them. And these confessions that have been extracted by force uh, will be used as the primary evidence before the Israeli military legal system. Uh, so mainly Palestinian children are arrested during night hours where the Israeli forces uh, invade the villages where they were uh, living, surrounded uh, their homes. Uh, in many cases, they forced their way in into children's uh, homes. Uh, so uh, after identifying the, uh, all the uh, occupants of that uh, home, they identify the child that they want to arrest. They do not inform the child or his family about the reason for the arrest or to where the child will be taken. Uh, so after identifying the child, uh, they uh, blindfolded him uh, and hand tied him and uh, take him to one of the military jeeps that are waiting outside. Usually, Palestinian children are placed on the metal, metal floor of the military jeeps and uh, transported to one of the interrogation center. So they reach the interrogation center, uh, uh, sleep deprived, exhausted, terrified, and uh, the interrogation started with the children. And the main purpose of the interrogation is to extract confession from them in order to be used in the Israeli military legal system. Uh, so, uh, usually the majority of Palestinian children give confessions to the allegation against them, regardless whether they commit these offenses or not. Um, uh, and uh, for us, uh, here the issue, not whether Palestinian children commit these offenses or not, we believe as a child right organization that children and adults also have the right to be free from ill treatment and torture because ill treatment and torture is absolutely prohibited under all international human rights um, uh, instruments. And here it's important to note that Israel almost is a state party to all international human rights or core human rights instruments. But when it comes to the rights of Palestinians who are living under the Israeli occupation, uh, it's um, Israel argue before the monitoring bodies that human rights conventions are not applicable to people who are living under occupation. What is applicable from the Israeli point of view is the international humanitarian law without identifying, and they regard that just the humanitarian aspect of the international humanitarian, not the legal aspect is applicable without uh, identifying exactly what the humanitarian aspects uh, are. So when it comes to international law, Israel is picking and choosing. So they choose whatever they want and um, they reject whatever they want. For example, Israel argue that they have the right under international humanitarian law to establish military courts, which is true. But when it comes to settlement and settlers, which is under international humanitarian law, it's war crime. They do not resort to the international human uh, humanitarian law. So they choose and pick whatever they want and they leave whatever uh, they, they want. And the problem here that the purpose of the Israeli military legal system is not to administer justice, but to suppress and control people who are living under occupation. So. It's very common that an Israeli settler who himself is illegal, living uh, in illegal settlement, is administrating justice in the Israeli military legal system. So you can imagine what's the outcome of this process. Some, somebody who himself is illegal is administrating justice in the Israeli military legal system. 
So the problem that because of mounting international criticism against Israeli practices in the occupied uh, Palestinian territories, especially against Palestinian children in Israeli detention, Israel did some modification to its military legal system in order to show that they are in line with the international standards. For example, in 20, uh, 2009, Israel raised the age of majority from 16 to 18, because before that uh, time, there was two ages of uh, majority, one applicable to Palestinian children under the Israeli military legal system, which is everybody below the age of 16, and one applicable to Israeli children under the Israeli civil system, which is everybody below the age of 18. So what Israel did, they raised the age of majority from 16 to 18 without giving any new right to Palestinian children who are 16 and 17. The other development that Israel did, it's related to the establishment of the Israeli military juvenile court. So in 2011, Israel is established the uh, juvenile military court. Uh, and this was because there was international criticism that Israel is prosecuted Palestinian minors before the Israeli military courts. So they introduced the Israeli military juvenile courts. But since that time until now, we are monitoring the conduct of this court. And we came to the conclusion that there is no differences between the Israeli military courts and military juvenile courts. Both courts are operating according to the same military order, the same judges, the same premises, everything is the same. Uh, so we believe that uh, uh, the issue, uh, the, uh, these amendments is to send a message to international community that we are uh, improving the Israeli military legal system in order to be in line with the international uh, standards. And, uh, and when speaking about the uh, right to life, we believe through our documentation, as I said, that uh, between 2000 and now, we documented the killing of 2,200 Palestinian children. And uh, most importantly, the way by which Palestinian children are killed. Uh, 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 it was clear for us that there is no respect to all international hum humanitarian law standards, mainly the issue of proportionality, distinction, and necessity. And this was clear through the uh, uh, documentation uh, for the Israeli military uh, uh, campaigns against Gaza Strip. Israel use military tactics like Hannibal Directive, which me uh, and they activate this directive when uh, whenever there is uh, an attempt to uh, capture an Israeli soldier. So when they activate this directive, they, uh, it means that uh, the Israeli soldier and the Israeli military can use whatever force in the, at their disposal. They uh, open fire in a very intensive manner, regardless the casualties among civilians, and even if it led to the killing of the Israeli soldier himself. Because for Israel, a dead uh, person is better than, or a dead soldier is better than a captured soldier because they do not want to find themselves in a situation where they have to bargain Palestinian groups in order to make prisoners swap. So this clarified the importance of the issue of prisoners in the Israeli military mentality. So uh, the other uh, military tactic, it's Dahi um, doctrine, and it's the same, open fire in a very intensive uh, manner to target civilian uh, areas. And the main purpose of this uh, is to put pressure on civilian people in order to practice pressure on the political parties to surrender. So uh, all these practices aims to control Palestinian people. And when we are speaking about um, militarization in Israel, militarization is everywhere. It's not uh, in the West Bank or in the occupied territories. It's even inside Israel and uh, Israeli officials make it very or made it very clear since the early beginning when they mentioned that we are a group of settlers 
And without the combat helmet and the barrel of the gun, we can't plant a tree or build a house. So uh, militarization in Israel and uh, everywhere. And um, the main message that Israel tries to convey to their uh, citizens that these practices in the occupied territories is to maintain your security. And uh, this is the main purpose, despite the fact that all their measures do not maintain the security of the Israeli civilians who are living in. Uh, and here it's important to note that security is not a neutral mission. It's part and parcel of the ideology of the state as a Zionist state. So all the Israeli practices in the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, even against children, it aims to dehumanize Palestinian people. So just to mention that one of the uh, uh, soldiers who gave uh, his testimony for breaking the silence when he spoke about Palestinian children, he mentioned that we are blinding Palestinian children in order not to see their eyes, because through seeing their eyes, they saw the human being that they are treating. So all these practices aims to dehumanize Palestinian people, among them Palestinian children. And for Israel, for example, it was a big deal when the New York Times in May this year uh, did a report where they uh, collected information about the names, the dreams, the pictures of Palestinian children and uh, published it in New York Times. So their main message that they do not want the international community to see Palestinians as a human being and all whatever Israel is doing aims to dehumanize uh, Palestinians who are living in the occupied territories. Thank you. I, I, can I, can I come, in, come in on you at that stage? Uh, we, I wanted to give some, uh, sorry for interrupting, I wanted to give uh, some time for questions. And uh, I think what, what you, some of the things you've said there are frightening. Um, and I think it will give rise to some questions that you might like to answer. I, I want I omitted to say at the beginning that uh, for the audience, uh, could you please uh, put questions in the chat as we proceed? And I'm sure Ayad's talk there has raised a lot of issues, uh, certainly has for me. If you direct the questions to questions for Kolov, that's a particular person in the in the box. They will get the questions to me and we will direct those to the speakers uh, later as, as we go along. But uh, thanks for that. I, 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 am I correct? Probably. And you, we'll come back to these things uh, that uh, there's children as young as 12, 13, 14 in military detention. It, it must be one of the few countries, if not the only country in, in, in the world that will detain children of that age in a military prison. It's, it's quite a frightening scenario, but we'll come back to these issues uh, later in the, in the webinar. So thank you very much, Ayad, for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So um, our next speaker is uh, Shahar Peretz, and uh, we're really delighted to have her here uh, this evening. Uh, she, she represents a growing uh, number of refusers. That would be... Uh, young Israeli uh, people who refused to serve in the IDF, that's the, the Israeli uh, Defense Forces. And she's, she was one of 120 teenagers who recently signed what we'd call a high school letter saying that when they graduated, they would refuse to serve in, in the army. Uh, and the protest is against the policies of occupation and apartheid in Gaza and the West Bank. Bank. Um, She's, I'll quote a, a sentence from her, the silencing of Palestinian refusers is just a small part of a more violent pattern of behavior. The silencing of the Palestinian struggle for human rights in the West Bank and Gaza. Shar will tell us of her personal experience uh, of growing up in militarized Israel. And uh, I'm really looking forward to her uh, speaking. So. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, Shahar, to say a few words. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and thank you for being here as well. 
Um, so I've been released from the army two and a half months ago after being in the military prison for three months. Um, I refused first time in August and then sent to the military, the military prison for the first time. And then it's like a process that you go in and out a military prison until they release you from the army. Um, so the decision to refuse um, started uh, when I was about uh, 14 years old. I went to a summer camp uh, with Palestinians and Israeli kids and children. Um, it was like five days that we slept together and played together and cook together. It, it uh, was first thing very fun. Um, but the other important thing is that it was the first time that I met Palestinians and um, people and kids at my age. And um, I went to this camp every summer since until um, two years ago. Um, and every year I learned more and heard more about the occupation and about the way that Palestinians live. And it was amazing to, to meet those people that in the Israeli news and school, we always hear about like uh, the enemy and the, like the bad people that we need to, to fight. We, we don't meet Palestinians or hear about Palestinians, uh, people or kids not in school, not in, youth movements and um, so it was really amazing to have Palestinian friends um, and of course when I met them and hear about their story I I realized how the army is connected to to the occupation and to the way that they are living um, because normal normally we don't Think that the army does something bad like we grow up in school thinking that the army the soldiers are the heroes and that um, we we wish to be them we wish to to become a soldier and to fight for israel and we don't imagine the things that the soldiers are responsible for and so first thing i I didn't want to become a soldier. I didn't want my Palestinian friends like to see me in uniforms, to see me become a soldier. It was very emotional at the beginning. And then I really started to, to learn about the occupation uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza. And, and I understood the, um, the bigger picture um, the the occupation that the Palestinians are living under and the things that for me are very um, like normal to go safe to school and to sleep well at night and then I heard so much stories from my friends about soldiers that walk to their homes at night and the friends of them that got arrested um, and it was really horrible to know it suddenly because we really I, I hadn't have like any idea of what's going on and um, because at schools in history or any classes we don't learn about uh, not about the occupation not about the Nakba not about anything um so that's when I started to to realize what is really happened. Um when I was about 16 years old, I joined a group organization that called the Salvot. It's um uh, the meaning is we refuse uh, in Hebrew. Um it's a, an organization that uh, helps young refusers to 
like go this process to their time in jail and also like um bring awareness to to the option to the possibility not to go to the army and to the option to say no I I won't do it I I don't believe in it I don't want to take part of it and so I've been there since I was 16 it and it was also when I refused to Uh, like in August it was a very very big help to um, like um, to go through it, to to go uh, through it easily, easily in the military prison and um, but also I think most important for me it was actually the first time that I've been in a group that said together, We don't go to the army. We refuse because in their friends group in school or in other places, there may be someone that doesn't go to the army, but it's surely not something that we talk about and not something that we speak about. And even when I was when I decided that I don't want to go to the army and I was very sure about it. and like inside myself, I still, I was afraid to say it. I wasn't like proud of myself and it's a very hard feeling to do it uh, alone. And then in, in this organization, it was the first time that it was like, oh, wow, we are um, a group. We do it together. Um, and also we um, wrote the Sheministim uh, letter, which is like a letter of the Uh, high schoolers? Yeah, high schoolers that uh, don't want to go to the army and uh, more than 100 uh, youth, Israeli youth uh, signed it. Um, a lot of them don't go, don't refuse um, like I did, which is like the way um, inside the, the military prison and like didn't went uh, public with their refuse, but they are still Uh, don't want to go to the army for the same uh, reasons but there are just like different ways to do it and um, so it also was a very big step in the progress of the refuse um, and then in, in the last August I uh, refused uh, officially to the to for going to the army and uh, I was been sent to jail for 10 days. Uh, for the first period and uh, then for 20 uh, yeah 20 and then 30 and, th and then again 30 and uh, as I said I got released two months ago and um, in the prison it was a very hard time but like of course of course it wasn't easy but I was trying to remembering to remembering myself and uh, that I'm doing something um, something right that I'm doing something good and uh, that I have a choice and and I use it because a lot of people like don't think of the army as a choice they are raised to go to the army and they want to go to the army and they like you have to go to the army so you can like not go but then okay I didn't go I did it And, and it was very, very good. And also I got uh, a lot of support from also organization in, in Israel, but also from people around the world. I got uh, thousands of, of letters uh, from people that supported me and uh, my family uh, gave them uh, to me at the prison and I could read it and it was very, very good. Um that's it, I think. Um, I will happy to answer any questions. Um, thank, thank, thank you very much, Shahar. That's interesting and it, it does raise a lot of questions. I, I have one myself, but I'll hold it off. Uh, there's a question that came in for Ayad there and uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll get to it. Ayad, if you could 
unmute yourself and I'll give you the question. Um, the question was, um, DCIP was uh, designated as a terrorist organization just recently, uh, one of six human rights organizations that was designated as a terrorist. So um, we, we have a terrorist on the panel here, but uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we won't take that seriously, but uh, I, I just I, I think it has to be taken seriously in some way because uh, it, it surely must affect your work. And that's the question. Does the does the designation as a terrorist organization, is it going to interfere with DCIP's work in the future? Uh, so if you unmute yourself, I had, or Robin, if you could un allow Ayat to unmute. Okay. You you got the question. Ah uh, yes yes yes. So I think the main purpose of designated the human rights and civil society organization as terrorist organization is to disconnect those organization from international support and solidarity. So uh, uh, before designating this organization as a terrorist organization, there was uh, Israeli uh, campaign in order to smear and defame this organization. And uh, Israel launched uh, this campaign through civil society organization like NGO Monitor, uh, Shurat Hadin, uh, UK lawyers for Israel and other civil society organization. And um, uh, these organizations were working in full coordination and cooperation with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Uh, and the main purpose was, is, was to uh, defame and discredit those organizations. So after years of their campaign, when they reached the conclusion that they didn't uh, achieve their objectives uh, in full, uh, Israel, official Israel, jumped in and designated those organizations as a terrorist organization. And the, uh, uh, now and before, it took a lot of effort from our uh, side in order to cope uh, with this situation because um, our donors, our partners, uh, uh, state parties, uh, UN agencies are asking about the information that they are receiving from the Israeli sites, whether the civil society organization or from uh, the Israeli government. And uh, we believe that they want to terrify uh, DCI as an organization, its staff members, uh, our partners, the banks that we are dealing with, the monetary companies that uh, we use. Uh, so uh, this is the main purpose is to terrify people who are dealing with the, uh, the DCI and the other five organizations who were designated as terrorist uh, organizations so far. Uh, we are continuing and uh, doing what um, uh, it takes in order to serve our clients and uh, to do the job that we are uh, doing. Uh, but we can't uh, predict how the future will be because they lay the legal uh, grounds in order to prosecute us as uh, staff members in the Israeli military uh, court system. They may confiscate our uh, assets. Uh, they may close our offices. So the horizon uh, bodes ill and open for uh, all scenarios. Yeah, th th thanks for that. Uh, just to further add on to that, uh, it has, uh, has your funding been affected uh, by the designation? Uh, right now, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, the, uh, we received from organization, UN agencies and governments, and all of them uh, received the Israeli uh, dossier uh, that uh, uh, justify the, uh, the decision of uh, designated us. And uh, these evidence were not 
uh, didn't convince anybody from uh, those uh, parties, but uh, uh, we can't uh, expect uh, what the future will bring. Okay, but, Th thank the yeah. mm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, th there's a question here from uh, uh, Stephanie for Shahar. Um, and what she's asking is, uh, what was the reaction of your peers, uh, like your schoolmates, I guess? A uh, more personal question, like, uh, I suppose friendships and things like that. Were, was there a, back, a pushback from your peers when you decided uh, to refuse to uh, do your military service? And Robin, if you again could unmute Shahar. Thank you. Um, so luckily, I think it didn't hurt uh, any close friendship uh, that I had with my friends. Um, of course, it affects like the bigger um, like circle of, of of the people that know me uh, from the family from from other places and um, a lot of people uh, was were angry uh, about me and was sad and uh, was saying also like bad stuff people that I know but uh, luckily the people that are really close to me uh, even if they didn't um, agree with me uh, most of my friends of course um, is now in the army uh, but they did understand, understood why I decided to refuse and respect it. Uh, but it's really not common uh, in the Israeli society. Okay, uh, thanks. So we will come back. Uh, there's another similar question for you, but I just want to go back to Ayad. We're, we're jumping between you uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, I had the, the question is related to uh, teenagers, Palestinian teenagers, who uh, I think the reports show most of those are in uh, in prison for stone throwing. Uh, and uh, the question really is uh, to do with when the children are released from prison, is, is there any counselling available or is there any way that you can try and help them not end back in the same situation uh, back in prison? Uh, so there's this revolving door of the, the children going in and out of prison for different different offences. Would you uh, like to say something on that? Uh, the, the, uh, we believe, uh, first of all, we are not an organization that provides psychological uh, support or uh, psychological rehabilitation for Palestinian children who are arrested and uh, interrogated by the Israeli military. But we believe uh, through our uh, modest experience that every child who is arrested, interrogated, and prosecuted in the Israeli military legal system will be psychologically affected. And the level of the psychological impact depends on the age of the child when he has been arrested, the, the forms of ill treatment and torture that the child passed through, and the period that he spent in Israeli prisons. Because the whole system is designed in a way in order to affect the psychological well-being of everybody who passed through this system. And you know that people's resilience uh, varied from one person to another person. So uh, the psychological impact varied from child to child. Uh, for example, uh, just a few uh, month, uh, months away, we heard about the case of Ahmed Banasra, the child from East Jerusalem who was mm. um, injured by uh, the uh, Israeli police and uh, his cousin was killed um, in uh, Shofat and um, he was arrested and there was uh, footage uh, for the child while he was interrogated by the uh, Israeli security agency. And uh, the, this case was um, uh, 
very well known uh, case because this child was arrested when he was less than 14. And according to the Israeli civil system, uh, children below the age of 14 can be pre prosecuted in the Israeli civil system, but they can't impose custodial sentence against them. So they took the child to a correction or a protection center. And when he reached the age of 14, they imposed a prison sentence for 12 years. And this sentence has been appealed and reduced to nine months. And uh, now uh, Ahmed is uh, suffering from uh, schizophrenia because of uh, his experiences. So uh, some children report uh, about uh, uh, psychological difficulties, uh, stress, uh, uh, sleep difficulties, and uh, so on as a result of uh, Hopefully, there are a lot of Palestinian organizations who provide psychological support for those uh, children and they try to reintegrate them in the Palestinian uh, uh, community. Okay, uh, th thanks, thanks very much. Uh, there, there, there is a question, a related question, Ayad. I'll just stay with you uh, for the minute. And it's, uh, it's another Ahmad, ah Ahmad Mansara. And, and this case has been highlighted a lot recently. This, uh, this child was arrested uh, 14 years ago, I think it is. And he's, uh, he's still, in still in prison, is it? And yeah. um, I, I, the question was, uh, is DCIP, have they any involvement in that case? Or, or is it when the child becomes uh, over the age that uh, you concentrate on the children? or? Would, would Ahmad Mansara, would he be a case you'd look at? Uh, Ahmad Mansara is the case that I talked to you about. Oh yeah, sorry, okay. And, and, and he, was, he, was, he was in prison for how long? Uh, he was arrested in October uh, 2015, sentenced for 20, uh, 12 years uh, imprisonment and uh, the appeal court um, uh, reduced his sentence for nine years and right now he is uh, still in prison and suf uh, suffering from psychological problems and okay. um, his lawyers uh, appeal or uh, that um, uh, there is uh, something in Israel especially, especially for under the civil system that after serving two-thirds of the sentence you can submit something in order to deduct uh, one third of your sentence. So uh, his lawyers uh, submit uh, this uh, issue and uh, their request uh, has been uh, denied. Yeah, th thank you. Now, I'm, so apologies there. I, the, question, the question had that came to me was that he, he was in prison for 14 years, but this isn't the case. Uh, he, he was sentenced to a long term, but he hasn't served it. So I assumed it was a different person. So apologies for that and, and to the person himself. Um, I'd go, go over, go back to you, Shatar. There's a, a question uh, here from Ronit Lenniton. And uh, Ronit is, uh, we, we've heard of before, and you're, you're really welcome to the webinar, Ronit. Uh, you have a great experience to offer uh, from your um, anti-apartheid struggles in South Africa. And uh, I think your expertise in this will be very useful in dismantling the, uh, the uh, Israeli apartheid system when the campaign gets underway, which it, it, it's already starting. So w welcome, Ronit, for that. Um, and the question to you, Shatar, is, uh, What's your plans now that you're free from the army? And uh, it seems to me that the army in Israel is uh, so tied into the society that if you refuse to serve in them, uh, I suspect there's long-term job issues and problems of uh, getting into the society. It seems, it seems the, uh, the jobs and occupations in the society seem so tied into the militarization. So are you, have you, are you fearful of your future, long-term future, in terms of uh, job prospects and occupation? Oh, hi. 
Um, so actually, as far as I know, the like official um, problems that you have when you don't go to the army are, are like in jobs uh, inside the government and the police and stuff, but I want to go anyway and work. So um, this is like the official one. Of course, there are um, social, social um, effects um, and I guess that in the future I will um, meet people that want, uh, will not want to hire me because I didn't uh, go to the army and stuff like that. Um, I hope it will be okay. Actually, I really don't know. Um, I don't know what I will do and I don't know uh, what will I face. Um, but when I refused, I decided that it's worth it, like that I'm sure um, about the fact that I want it, I need to refuse and I will um, be okay with whatever uh, will come up. Um, and I I'm just want to add that it's not that something that everyone can say, uh, can say. it's like, um, I don't know how to like um, because of the military and the army is so so connected to to everything uh, in this place. So really, people that um, young people that don't have the support from their families, from their friends, um, can go really hard time uh, when they refuse and after that and. Um, so like, it's not something that everyone can have the say of like, I, I will be okay. I have the luck and the privilege to know that, that I will be okay if I refuse. And it was part of the reason uh, that I chose it because if I have the privilege, so in my opinion, like I have to do it. Um, but there are, are people that really um, don't want to go to the army and can't because uh, some reason, but, uh, okay, can, can uh, there's there's a related question there, so I'll leave you on the screen uh, for a minute, and uh, you you you've answered it in some ways, but the the, the question really is directed uh, to your father, and uh, mm -hmm. we let you speak for a few minutes anyway uh, to see is it is it hard for to be a father of a refuser. <laughs> Or uh, what, like, um, yeah, maybe tell us, uh, do you get a backlash from friends or what? Well, um, I was a refuser myself. Uh, ah, okay. So I knew, uh, even though there are changes, uh, like uh, it was 40 years ago. So um, even though there are changes in terms of the jail system, etc., I knew what she was going through, and uh, I knew the main thing, which is if she is confident in her decision uh, and is in jail for a great reason, uh, she will be okay. And so, of course, uh, um, <coughs> there are different things, like daily things uh, that you go through that uh, are unpleasant, and jail is unpleasant. Uh, of course, uh, there are different types of jails, and, and uh, uh, Israeli jail for soldiers uh, is nothing uh, <coughs> to compare to so, uh, jails uh, for Palestinians. Yeah, so uh, everything is relative, but uh, nevertheless, it's still uh, a prison. But um, you know, I, I didn't have any problem with her being in prison. We supported her as much as we could uh, in on a almost daily basis, if, if we could, depending on, on the time. Um, luckily, uh, the jail is very close to us. Uh, by, <laughs> by chance, it, it's like a new location. Uh, we, uh, it moved uh, near us just uh, a few months ago. So we, we were able to go on weekends and other times, uh, like see her from outside, like go to the <laughs> near the fence and um, and sing and, and shout and uh, let her know that uh, we support her. 
Uh, so yeah. we, we very much wanted this to end. And th that's, that's the, the, uh, a problem because you don't know when you refuse, whether you'll be three months or five months, or some people have been there for in, in prison at different times, like for two years. So uh, it's, it's really unknown. And we're, we're, we were relieved when uh, she got the uh, release uh, after three months. And uh, w w while I have you on the microphone, uh, maybe you could uh, tell the audience um, uh, from your 40 years experience, uh, like is, is the refuser campaign, is it growing or does it just represent 1% uh, of the population or is it getting smaller or... Um, just say say a few words of what he, which direction is it going, and is it so small that it can it makes no difference? It is it is very small uh, overall. However, uh, it is substantially larger than forty and fifty years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, we knew some refusers, but they were really handful. Um, the refusal, uh, like uh, really handful refusers uh, in the 70s and, and, and the beginning of the 80s. Um, what I think pushed the refusal uh, into the awareness of, of the public was the Lebanon war, uh, because it was the first time where there were many refusers in jail um, sometimes even 30 at, at a given point uh, together or in two different jails. Uh, so it's still, unfortunately, it's still a marginal uh, size movement. However, it is a lot more uh, vocal, a lot more um, um, present um, and um, Unlike the situation of individual refusers uh, several decades ago, now people can find information, uh, public information uh, on the web or uh, through friends. Uh, and there, are, there is more than one organization that supports uh, refusers in different ways. So, okay. Mr. Vot, but there's also a new profile. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's. Uh, and also yes uh, gvul so there are really uh, many more options and if like a few decades ago you, you did it and you were really on your own isolated now it's different because you have uh, public limited public support from people who support refusal but uh, it's it's a lot uh, a lot easier i think a lot easier to to refuse these days Mm. Th th thanks very much for that. Sorry, Shahar, for taking your, he's robbing your, your limelight here. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to, um, there's another question here for Ayad. I'm, I'm flipping over and back. Yeah. And Ayad, I'll, I'll read it to you and uh, then you, you, you can re respond. Uh, uh, we hear of some dictatorships treating children the way you described uh, the Israeli treatment. And if that was happening, there'd be an international outcry. Why, why do you think the world, or rather the West, lets Israel off the hook in their treatment of Palestinian children? Um, maybe you'd comment on that, on that question. Uh, simply, there is no political will to put pressure and the practice pressure on Israel. So Israel enjoy the impunity from the international community. So the problem that uh, the issue of the Israeli violation against Palestinians among uh, them children is among the most reported uh, mm -hmm. uh, all over the world. But uh, the problem that the international community, when it comes to the Israeli practices, uh, they just, uh, the maximum, they criticize these practices without taking any actions to put 
an end to these practices. And uh, now it becomes uh, very clear just to compare what uh, is going now uh, against Russia after mm. uh, mm. the in uh, Ukraine and uh, the Israeli war crimes, crimes against humanity since 70 years or more. So uh, during the whole period, the international community didn't use uh, any of uh, the uh, action at their disposal in order to punish Israel to stop these violations. But within a few hours, the international community uh, activate all the sanction against uh, the Russia. So when we are speaking about, uh, about human rights, we do not speak about the pure principles. Uh, always uh, politics jump in and the interest of uh, the governments and the states in their relation uh, play the tone. So uh, this is uh, simply the issue the lack of uh, uh, the political will in order to put a pressure on Israel to stop mm -hmm. these uh, violations. Uh, it's not related to the, let's say, the commission of uh, inquiries that the uh, Human Rights Council or other uh, UN agencies uh, form in order to examine and investigate and bring uh, uh, recommendations to rectify the situation. It's related to, so far, uh, the, uh, the state parties, they uh, sacrifice their human rights and uh, legal obligation in order to maintain a good political and diplomatic relation with Israel. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, it's, it's interesting you referenced uh, Ukraine and uh, what's happening with uh, Russia and Ukraine. And it seems, it seems to me that in, in occupations, certainly, and in probably all war situations, children seem to be the, uh, uh, a big part of the people who suffer the most. And uh, I think your organization is right to focus on the needs of children in the occupied territories in Gaza. And yeah, it's good. There's a related question, and you've touched into the politics now, so we're probably in some trouble here. Um, the question is, uh, Israel, Israeli society is militarized and uh, uh, expressed it by conscription. And the question is, uh, do you think conscription is an inevitable consequence of settler colonialism? It's, we're, we're deep in the politics now. <laughs> Pardon, I, could, uh, I couldn't hear you well. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the question is, do you think the conscription into the IDF and uh, countries that have conscription, do you think it's an inevitable consequence of settler colonialism? The, the, uh, for sure, yes. Because mm. Uh, the main message from Israel to its settlers, to its uh, citizens, that uh, and we are here in order to uh, protect you. To it's uh, the uh, actions that we are doing, and it's for your own good. Without these actions, you will not uh, live in security. So, and uh, the. Uh, the campaign against the objectors, it's not because uh, Shahar uh, didn't uh, attend the army. Uh, they have uh, millions in the army, but they want to target the symbol. Uh, so the symbol that she did, they do not want to be repeated and become uh, uh, a symbol for uh, others uh, to follow. And the uh, uh, and this is the same practice when the Israelis target Palestinian children who are throwing stones, not because stones are uh, dangerous or may affect the security of the state, but because they want, they do not want this symbol of resistance. Mm -hmm. So for them, most importantly, is to uh, dominate the mind of people who are dealing with. So, and this is the case of every, uh, every oppressor in their relation with the oppressed people that they are dealing with. The mitre weapon at their hand is the mind of the oppressed. And uh, 
So the symbolic issue, it's a big deal for them. Hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, Shahar, do, do you want to come in on that? Uh, uh, anything to say about settler colonialism and militarization or? No. OK, we leave it. it. It's interesting that, you know, uh, other settler colonial countries, uh, I suppose we look at the US and we look at more recently South Africa, they all became very militarized also, you know. So Israel is just, I guess, another example in a list of countries that have had to become militarized to uh, oppress the people that they're occupying. And uh, that's probably the analysis. Uh, um, I think we're nearly out of uh, questions. Uh, maybe time for one more. If, if I'm, I'm just searching for one now. Um, yeah, it's, it goes back to you, Ayad. Um, and I think you've really already answered. It's about the issue of the international media. And uh, it seems that the international media pay little attention uh, to situations in that's happening to children in in Palestine. Um, and th the question is, why do you think the international media ignore the plights of, of uh, what's happening to Palestinian children? But maybe a few more words, but I think you've answered it in a way. Yeah, no, I think because the issue of the Israeli violation against Palestinian children so it become uh, repetitive. So always media is looking for something uh, which is new and uh, abnormal. So, and uh, maybe the answer to this question, because whenever Israel prepare for its military campaign, they prepare as well for the media campaign. What messages they want the international media to pick and to concentrate on. To give examples, when the second intifada was absolutely peaceful, the main message at that time that Palestinian women sent or mothers sent their children to the front lines in order to uh, serve as a human shells. And this message attracted the attention of the international me media. So they start doing reports about uh, the uniqueness of Palestinian mothers and how they are different from international mothers. Uh, if we, uh, and it attracted the attention of the media and they forget about all the atrocities that Israel is committing during that time. When they, they invaded Jenin camp, the main message was uh, Israel, uh, Palestinian militants are misusing the ambulances in order to transport militants from one place to another place. And it attracted the attention of the media and it becomes the issue at that time. When they, uh, uh, in one of the Israeli military campaign against Gaza, one of the main messages was that Palestinians are misusing the Anarwa cars in order to transport missiles from one place to another place. So all these dis or misinformation attract the attention of the media in order to highlight. So whenever the media is trying to just remind the people that Palestinians are humans, they will be under attack and uh, because they don't want the international co community to find uh, or, to, or to discover that Palestinians do not deserve the practice that Israel is practicing against them. Okay, Th thank, thanks, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, and a final question, Shahar, to you um, is to do with um, a, a group Growing up in school, in, in an Israeli school and, and uh, spending time there, how, how is the militarization, how, how does it enter the school and how does it enter the curriculum in terms of preparing you to automatically join the army? Mm -hmm. There must be some preparation or, or that, that goes on 
at an early age. Uh, could you comment on the militarization within the school system? Um, yeah, of course. Um, it's hard to think of it because it's so like um, normal and like um, you don't really see it because you're so used to it. Um, there are actually soldiers in school um, some school all the time. There are jobs in the army that is like a, a called like a teaching soldier, which her job, their job is like to be a teachers and at school. So there are also uh, soldiers who are teachers, and they also, of course, every Memorial Day, and they are like uh, how long is it? Serenities. Serenum is uh, when the like um, people that graduate school comes with their uniforms and then um, tell oh. about their service and then um, every like in the Purim holiday when you make like a little um, gifts we are always like preparing them for the soldier yeah. and sending them and write them letters and draw them drawings and also in the, I don't know which class it is, it's about uh, 17, 16, there's something, uh, it's called Gadna in Hebrew. It's like a week that they send um, people from school to the army to like uh, get to know it, like you, you shoot a little bit and you learn a little bit and you wear uniforms. It's like, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be something that will like make you want to go to the army. And um, like they give it to school that not a lot of people um, even use. What is this number? Low percentage. Low percent um, of people that go into the armies to encourage them that the army is fun and they should uh, go there. Um, and also, of course, it's not only in schools, like on the way to school in the best, there are always soldiers uh, with their weapons, drive, like you see soldiers all the time. And I remember in one time I was uh, in Paris with my mother and we went to the Eiffel Tower and there were like, so the, Soldiers from the camp, from the police, I don't know. Uh, and I was so scared of them. They were like with their guns, and like it, see, it like seems so extraordinary. Yeah, so weird and extraordinary. And then I realized that here in Israel, we have it all the time, all, all day. And um, we're just so used to it. We don't pay attention. Mm. Okay, thank, thank, thanks for that. Yeah, that's yeah. It's so I suppose normal that you don't recognize it as as being so insidious. Yeah, it's yeah, that's uh, I think I think I'm looking at the clock here ahead of me, and it's it's just uh, well eight fifteen here in Dublin, which means ten fifteen where uh, I had and you are. So. Um, we don't want to keep you up uh, too much longer. I think I think we'll wrap up the questions there, and uh, thank you to, to to both of the speakers there, and thank you uh, Shomro for uh, helping with the Hebrew translation. That was very useful to us. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do is call on Robin O'Born from our Kolov Justice for Palestine group, and she'll just say a few words of how to stay in touch with us. Uh, so Robin, where are you? There you are. I'm here. Um, yes. Yeah, just very briefly, I just want to say thanks again to um, our guest speakers today um, for taking the time to come and speak to us all tonight. And thanks also to our um, facilitator, um, Dermot, for his hard work that he's put in this evening and also in the run up to tonight's event. Um, Kolov, just so, for Sorry, Robin, time. can I just come in on you? Uh, sorry if I... Uh, we, uh, Miko Pilled, uh, obviously, uh, sent his apologies and he, he's missing, but uh, uh, and we apologize to the people who uh tuned in the audience, um, uh, hoping to hear from him because uh, 
as you know, he's, uh, he's quite a, a good articulate speaker and uh, apologies for people who particularly came to the webinar to hear him. Sorry, uh, uh, Robin. No, no problem. Um, just to say briefly, I think uh, that COLAV, Justice for Palestine, um, it's a working group that falls under the, the COLAV umbrella. Um, we meet every couple of weeks. Um, we're always open to new membership. We're a very friendly group. We don't require any prior experience or expertise if, if for anybody that might like to join. But otherwise, if you just like to stay in touch with us, um, you can do so. And I'll just share our details here. Um, you can do so by following us on Instagram, on Twitter, um, on the Facebook page, which is very active, um, or for just getting in touch with us um, uh, via email at just, just for pal at colav.org. Um, so yeah, that's all. Um, I just, I'll pass back to Jeremy then just for the final words. That's okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'll just um, ask the to panelists, uh, Ayad and uh, Ayad first, just to give us a sentence of encouragement or a parting word or a suggestion for us of uh, how we can support the uh, Palestinian human rights situation. And most importantly, to keep pressure on your uh, representative and government to do what she should they do in order to live up to their obligation under international uh, uh, law. So without the international pressure, I think that Israel will continue its violation against Palestinians who are living in the occupied uh, territories and uh, uh, make allusions for the Israelis uh, uh, about uh, to justify their practices and to, uh, to make them convinced that these practices is for their own good. Thank you. And Shahar would say a word or two or a sentence. <laughs> um, first, I agree with uh, I have a lot. I think the international um, oh, I forgot pressure. pressure. Yeah, sorry. I forgot the mm. word. Uh, it's very, very important because it seems that we can't do it ourselves here. Um, and from my point of view, I can say um, very personally that this support that I got from people really all around the world was very, very important for me and really made me do this, these things and uh, more happy and more sure. So. Um, I think this is something that you can really do for the next people who will refuse. Just work them a, a little letter. It's very, very encouraged. And um, of course, to, to just share information and to share um, what is really happened. I think from my perspective as a young uh, Israeli, it's, it's, it's all, all the things all the things that change for me and uh, like to know what's going on and uh, it's the most important thing and we really need to work on it and uh, so everyone in Israel and in the world will know uh, what's happening. Okay th th thanks very much for that it, uh, it all sounds simple just uh, meet our international obligations and uh, keep pressure on our government um, so uh, we'd encourage the audience uh, to do that. And in that light, I, ju I just saw something there that came in. There's a, there's a protest, an anti-apartheid protest outside the Israeli embassy tomorrow in Dublin. Um, it's actually on, it's, I think, Shelbourne Road, not the embassy itself. And it's organized by Amnesty International. And I, I guess this is a kickoff of uh, an anti-apartheid struggle. And it's, it, that's interesting. Uh, the date was chosen a little off the date, but 21st of March was the uh, Sharpeville massacre in 1960 in South Africa. So I, I think Amnesty has picked that date to be as close to the remembrance of the Sharpeville massacre. Uh, which uh, which was an anti-apartheid demonstration itself, 
in 1960. So uh, I think we have a historic time uh, for Israel and uh, it, it, we, we'll see what how things go. So folks, I, I, think, I think that's really, I have to call it a night. Uh, again, thank very much the two speakers we had and uh, thank you Kolov for hosting and uh, Kolov Justice for Palestine for doing the organization and uh, Robin for doing the technology in the background. So Slan Alkas Iwa O Balya which is the Gaelic for uh, good night and uh, keep safe. And we'll see you all again at our next webinar. Thank you and thank you for the audience. I hope you found it interesting and stimulating. Uh, good night. Thank you.